and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Standard Studios, but they are not standard. And the and the first time I've had to deal with a half minute ti a half hour time zone difference. Yeah. <laughs> the one and only Taylor Hadfield. How are you doing today, Hello. man? Hello. I'm doing I'm doing good, Mildred. Um Kickstarter's doing well. Uh lots of prep, super busy. Uh but it's been a it's been an absolute blast so far. Yeah, congrat congrats on getting at the time of this recording just shy of two thousand dollars Canadian. Absolutely. Oh yeah! Wow, it went up a hundred dollars in the last hour. Man, that's awesome. Which is uh, saying something because you're on, you're only shooting for three hundred and thirty Canadian or um, two hundred and forty seven in freedom bucks. In freedom dollars, not in Canadian pesos. <laughs> um, that's, <literally laughs> that's it. No, yeah. but uh, no, it, it's great because I. I've I've done I've done a lot of design and I've done a huge amount of of dungeon mastering and game mastering for mostly for um, Call of Cthulhu fifth edition fourth edition a whole bunch of other custom systems um, and it, it's it's I really wanted to make this project come to life and I did set the goal to sort of a level where I was like, okay, maybe if, you know, if a couple of people buy this and get the book and I ha and I can do a ton of play testing, then that would be awesome. That was, that was my minimum goal. And then we broke that goal in four hours and, <laughs> and, and, and now we're here and, and I, I, this is going to be a phenomenal book. It's going to have the system. It's going to have all three of the starter adventures. I'm, I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. So it's tradition around here to go into the humble beginnings so okay. with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Absolutely. So um, my first introduction to role-playing games was essentially late to mid 2010s. Um, I'd, I'd played some of the Dungeons and Dragons, like Xbox games and that kind of thing, that those that came out. Um, so stuff, but... stuff like Dark Alliance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I run into um, back then, of all people, the Ogs cast um, in my you know uh, teenage mind. Um, they did a D and D podcast. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. So I I went out and I ended up getting my hands on a uh, fourth edition starter set and a bunch of maps. Uh, yes, the the edition that the edition I'm told I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because they don't pay me. Exactly. Um, fourth edition has fourth edition has major flaws when you look at it like a D and D game, but looking at it as like a combat game and a game that was meant to be played online, it it's totally fine. That's a lot of fun. I've I've I have gone to bat for four, uh, for um, fourth edition, mm -hmm. but I ha but I have cr I have critiqued it. I just find I just think that the more popular critiques are a little bit misguided. Uh, the yeah, whole... and they don't take into account the good things. Like the, I think the bright point for fourth edition, like the really good thing that they did, um, the the stat blocks and monster design, I thought was phenomenal. Especially like, well, yeah, I mean the stat blocks and monster design was was great. They were concise. They had unique abilities. All of them did. Um, I still, I when I was running fifth edition, I still poured it over some monsters from fourth edition, right? Because they're, they're just they were so unique. They had things they could do. Like you look at the red dragon in fifth edition and you compare it to any red dragon from fourth edition and you're like, oh my gosh, right? I do find it funny when the, when when um, wizards tried to f try to do that whole thing of, hey, we're we're not going to have we're not going to have ass assigned assigned a built assigned negative modifiers to races in, anymore, and, and I'm sitting here going, you solved this problem back in two thousand eight, you don't get a cookie. <laughs> Yeah, because that was that was brought up as a selling point when for, when fourth edition was being developed that they were killing off the whole ne the whole negative modifier on on races. 
Yeah, I mean, if I mean, if there's, you don't need a, a negative modifier per se. I mean, I I understand the the tempting to do it when it comes to like, well, I mean, uh, if I remember correctly, some of the only negative modifiers in fifth edition for races were in Volos with. Um, I'm not sure if the orcs got like a minus intelligence or something, but I know kobolds got like a minus strength, and yeah. like that stuff is kind of like it's easy to slip into that. But the, the reason time, why they killed it off for fourth was. It was that they felt it was becoming harder and harder to justify the, to justify the positive ne positive negative um, pairing setup. Mm -hmm. um, the example that the example that was used, and I dis I distinctly remember this article was um, Warforged having getting a hit to charisma. If you yeah. apply if you think if you apply charisma as physical appearance, maybe you can make that argument. But um, if you apply, the, but that is not what charisma is, and the, even the um, the first edition DM's guide name dropped Napoleon as somebody who was not <laughs> okay. physically attractive, but was charismatic. Yeah, and I guess if you make the warforged argument, like you also need to basically justify it. it's like okay, so do do orcs, goblins, kobolds. Um, and you know a plethora of other playable races in that system. Do they also have a negative to charisma? Because they're some combination of ugly or antisocial or whatever else, right? So it's it's not a great negative modifiers aren't a great argument. The only time the only time that I've that I've used negative modifiers personally is for is for say um say say cybernetics or in one experiment where I had it that instead of using hit points you were taking hits to your um, ability scores. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Base, and base... I, I do, I do see like, I do not, not that I, not that it really comes up in bronze age collapse, unless it comes up through like DM fiat per se. But like, I do see, I do see something nice in like ability score damage, like draining someone's constitution or that kind of thing. Traveler has been doing that. Traveler has been doing that for years. Mm, awesome. Of course, I only recommend doing that in games where you're, where high lethality is expected, and well, Traveler is infamous for the fact that you can die during character creation. I have heard that. Yeah, but I I did have I did have to I did have to bring that bring that kind of thing up because it's it will always be funny to me how how a lot of the things that people lambast um, fifth edition for were sol were solved in fourth. Mm -hmm. Oh, and and ju and just the just the fact that um, the the backlash one of the bit one of the big ones that a lot of people have have talked have talked about is this whole idea of tur of turning D and D into tabletop WoW. Except I couldn't help but notice that a lot of the people making that argument aren't playing MMOs. Yeah, no, I feel like that that image of WoW, for better or for worse, I mean, probably for better, to be honest, um, is that classic game, right? Is yeah. that sort of classic setting, which is it is a phenomenal and I enjoy the setting at least. Um, but but I do totally get that. But it's it's a setting where um, and, and it is kind of like the the quote unquote standard D&D &D high fantasy setting where there's, you know, everything from. Pixies, elves, warforged, potentially um, kobolds, uh, dragonborn—you know, keep 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 the list going, right? And it definitely lends itself to a certain kind of game, uh, which and again, that that game is a lot of fun. But if you're trying to run um, in in the case of Bronze Age Collapse, for example, and this is part of the reason for the system's creation, if you find a setting that you really want to run, and fifth edition D D or some other system like call of cthulhu for example just doesn't have the carrots and sticks to really get people excited about it or make playing in that setting fun then it's great to find a system or in again in the case of bronze age collapse make a system which you know for bronze age collapse is tailored for that right like i i, I wanted to run I wanted to run games set during the collapse of the Bronze Age and during that whole sort of period of turbulence and in Mesopotamia and in Greece and in Northern Egypt and in that whole sort of area. But I found that 
most of the cell, many of the set, and, and I, don't get me wrong, you could run a game in that setting with a bunch of different systems, but very few of the systems, if any of them, I, that I found were tailored to that campaign setting. So that's where this sort of comes up from. This system is made with, expressly with that sort of like Bronze Age fa fantasy setting in mind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I yeah. it didn't escape my notice that you that um. You had named that you had name dropped Robert E. Howard, H.P. Lovecraft, and Homer in the Kickstarter yeah. page. Absolutely, um, I'm a big fan of Conan. Mm -hmm. Conan the Barb yeah, I'm a huge fan of Conan. Um, love a bunch of Lovecraft's work, and I've ran Call of Cthulhu for a, for a bunch of years now. It's a ton of fun. Um, and and of course, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm one of the one of the adventures I'm including in this Kickstarter is literally set during the siege of Troy mm -hmm. and who, who else is better for that? But Homer, he, yeah. you know, the Iliad is, is a phenomenal, is a phenomenal story. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the other, the other, well, first of all, since you mentioned being a fan of Conan, I would like to ask, um, how, what's your take on, um, call on call. Yeah. Uh, call. Uh, actually, I'm kind of unfamiliar with call. I've I've seen some I've seen some say call is is a pro, is a proto Conan. Uh, I hmm. don't I don't quite agree I don't quite agree with it with that statement. But what is funny is um, everybody assumes that what that one of Conan's biggest villains was Thulsa Doom, except. Thulsa mm. Doom was never was never in any of the Co never in any of the Conan stories. He was in he was originally in Cull. Oh, I see what you're saying. I, well, I mean, people would say that Thulsa Doom is one of one of those Conan one of the better Conan villains. I would say honestly because of the Arnold movie, right? <laughs> right. He sort of at least for the mainstream, um, that movie is sort of the quintessential image of Conan for a lot of people, right? And Thulsa I Doom is the is the big bad in that. A quintessential image, but also an image that's not accurate. It was an image that oh, was sure. born out of the fact that Arnold is not ex is not a very good speaking actor, and definitely wasn't at the time because that was his second movie. Oh, really? I didn't his, know that was his second movie. His oh. his first was Hercules in New York, where he oh, was dude. dubbed over. Oh, seriously? Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's, they, that's yeah, really they good. had. <laughs> I don't know why, but they had somebody else dub dub over his voice. Mm hmm. But yeah, and of even, even if it's a, even if it's inaccurate, though, I do like. Uh, for example, the battle at the the battle at the mountains mm -hmm. at that movie. I have heard that soundtrack play so many times, and it is in half of my D and D combat sort of playlists. So. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying the. I'm not by any means gonna gonna say that the movie is bad. It's just it can it can give the wrong image of uh, of Conan. Mm -hmm. uh, especially, especially since a lot of people use that as a point of comparison with the Momoa film, which had which had its problems, but I but I would say, but um, I think a lot of people had the idea that the that that Momoa version was a remake when it's not, and mm -hmm. the the director of it made explicitly clear that it that it isn't. The thing with the Conan movie too is that Conan, the story of Conan is is long, and it takes place over you know a ton of a ton of different content and a ton a ton of different sort of you know uh, books and and, con and uh, medium and the mm -hmm. such, right? So the the movie, even if the movie is inaccurate, it is still a like it's a snapshot. It's not the whole story, right? There were pl there were plans at one point to do. Conan as as a James Bond like anthology character. That'd be interesting. It kind of be the. I mean, I, I I would I would love I would kill for a Conan show with uh with an Arnie like actor. Uh, we al we almost got we almost got a Conan <laughs> show we almost got a Conan show on Amazon. Oh really? Uh, interesting. The the guy who's now the showrunner for House of the Dragon, uh, oh, originally yeah. had penned a script that was going to be an adaptation of the Frost Giant's daughter. Then the management okay. change up up at Amazon happened, 
And this mm. this has nothing to do with ring with Rings of Power. It was meant to be alongside Rings of Power of of one one of them being an all ages fantasy and one of them being a more adult oriented fantasy. And obviously Conan is not going to be an adult a um, all ages story. But yeah, the pl that but that was the that was the general plan. Then are you familiar with the work of Frank Frazetta? Yes, I I have I have. I have three of his prints on my wall here. I I am absolutely in love with Frank Frazetta and like that sort of. Yeah, I know that Conan is a Conan would definitely be a rough story to tell without dipping into the M. That is a you you need to sort of go to the adult for that. Yeah, right. but then then who the new management decided no we're we're gonna go with Wheel of Time instead for our for our more mm -hmm. adult fantasy which. Having read Wheel of Time myself, that was going to be dead on arrival. I said it was going to be dead on arrival, and I was proven right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but th but the guy, but then the same guy who had written that that um, Frost Giant's daughter script was approached was approached by HBO, and and they were like, "Hey, you want to work on Game of Thrones?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he he said yes to that. So let this be a lesson of never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. Yeah, because and honestly, I I enjoyed House of the Dragon. I am excited for more, and it's going to take a hot minute because I think it's like twenty twenty four. It's coming out, I think. The next yeah, season. But, but I was a huge fan. But um, you can't tr you contrast the re the reaction to that to the reaction of we to of Wheel of T of Wheel of Time, and it's like maybe mm. you should have kept the guy around. <laughs> yeah, like I. I... I have never heard of the I, I've never heard the Wheel of Time show mentioned anywhere but online. But online, no one I know has talked to, like no one I know in person per se, or even talking to on Discord. I has really like mentioned it or heard of it or all the such, and that that kind of points to it, right? But absolutely. Mm -hmm. And now, to, now with that with that in mind. When it came to the when it came to the creation of Bronze Age Collapse as a as a game as a game proper, yeah. um, it mentions that you're going with the stand with the standard array of polyhedral dice. But the question that I often have with these sort of things is, what is the what is the mechanic that is the all roads lead to Rome? Mm. Is it Obviously, obviously, the most the most litigious role playing game has it where it's d d twenty plus modifiers against a difficulty, and you're trying to roll high. Yes. Um, Fading Suns is d twenty blackjack, where you're trying to aim low, but as close to the line as you can get. And there, and well, you already mentioned Call of Cthulhu, so you know, so it Christian so Kyle, you're dealing fifth, with yeah, the whole d, thing. Yeah, d one hundred aim as low as possible. Um. What approach do you have? What approach do you have in mind with Bronze Age Collapse? Yeah, hundred percent. So let's take the example of, let's say that two spearmen, each with a shield, are sort of fighting on a, on like a beach, mm -hmm. for example, or on a plane or on a beach. You know, very you know, basic as you can get combat. Um, if if one of those fighters makes an attack, per se, at the other fighter, or I say fighter warrior, mm -hmm. um. That warrior character makes a d20 roll, adds his might, and then if that number is greater than the opponent's uh, might plus nine, so for example, like um, if both characters have a might score of five, hmm. and I should mention might not only symbolizes physical strength, but also the weight of your deeds and martial prowess and that kind of thing. So if one character, if both characters have a might of five, then one character would need to roll a d20 plus their might and beat a 14 or match it. Mm -hmm. Because 9 plus 5, in that case, 14, that would essentially be the number to hit. All right. And I'm, I'm guessing each of the core, core ability scores are like that, where you you have the modifier that you're going to be using when you're rolling and, the, and, uh, the, and a static defense. Uh, somewhat. Yeah. So I mean, it depends on it depends on the attack. Mm -hmm. um, it is it's pretty straightforward in a sense in that there's no real like we're not really calculating AC here. Um, it really is like for another example is an archer firing 
an archer firing an arrow at a warrior with the shield, we'll say, right? Um, the warrior with the sh the archer essentially needs to hit nine plus the warrior's agility, and if the archer hits that, then the archer hits the warrior, right? So it really is either like a contest of might; they're both pitting their might against each other, or they're pitting their sort of dex or dexterity, agility, speed, nimbleness, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, it really is a case of like, like against like, right? Yeah. And with that, with that in mind, do you have? Since we're dealing with D twenty, are you do are you doing the whole natural twenty, natural one kind of setup? Yeah, less on the. Uh, I mean, of course, as a DM, you could do what you want with that natural one. If you want to make it do nothing special, you can go for it. If you want to make the natural one be a horrible failure and death, you can go for it. Um, as per the core rules, ones aren't really going to make a difference in that sense. It's basically always going to be a fail. Natural 20s, though, are crits, 100%. And some weapons and skills and the such will uh, maybe let you crit on a 19, let you crit on an 18, that kind of thing. And in the cases of damage, a critical hit is just double damage. Um, and we'll touch on what double damage means in a little bit, but that is that is the sort of essence of it. Um, and th at the same time, a 20 on, say... Uh, let's take an example here. A uh, 20 on, say, a talk check to try to uh, barter someone down or try to discover some kind of new information from a local. Um, a 20 on a talk check will still be a critical success and will still get you some extra information or such and such. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the, ne the next thing that I'd want, I'd want to ask about is... There are, there are, um, there are, there are five, not five, six, um, six, abil six abilities. Yes. And I'm, scores, I'm guessing, uh, now with, with the ones I see, you have might, agility, spirit, wisdom, and talk. I'm guessing those are the ones that would have a that would have a static defense, or is it just might, ability, and spirit? Yeah. So um, might, agility, spirit, wisdom, and talk all have. You would essentially assign them either a d6 each when you're making your character, mm -hmm. or assign them a static array of. Uh, and and th this this part specifically might be open to change, but say five four three three two two, mm -hmm. and just fill out your stats like that. As for defense, like you mentioned in combat, um, might and agility are essentially they're the they're the main go tos for any kind of static defense in combat. However, um, in the case of sorcerers fighting other sorcerers or using words of power to sort of halt people in their tracks or cause flood water to rise up out of the ground, that kind of thing. That would be a spirit check, or that would be a sort of contesting spirit. Yeah. I also noticed when it comes to Homeland, which, given that this is a human-centric campaign, would be the equivalent to race in a lot of fantasy games. It's mm -hmm. largely a... And may, maybe this is something you're considering changing or not. It's largely a modifier to one of the, co one of the core attributes, and is, is it a case where you get to the two features or just one of them? Yeah, so we wanted to really make, because uh, like you mentioned, this is a human-centric game. This is, this, at least with the, or, sorry, especially with the adventures that we're putting out, the setting that we're building here is a rooted in classic history setting, um, but the magic is, the magic is present. The magic does exist. The myths are true. It, it is a mythical version of the real world 1250s essentially um and that sort of you know vague period around there if you want to run a game in 1100 or earlier or you know after this whole thing happens go for it um but it is a bronze age system so that it takes up that whole age you could play um so it is important because we don't have because we are a human-centric setting here that 
these homelands are really fleshed out and they all have their own feel and culture and character. Mm. So in addition to the statistics and mechanical benefits in the book for each homeland, we'll also have a write up and some text and really try to give you the feel of what it means to be from each place and like how they dress, how they look, how they fight, how they talk, some of the gods they worship, their culture, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, with, and I'm, ge I'm guessing, I'm guessing each one of them. Once you put in the fluff, you'll probably have a page, de a page dedicated to each homeland on the, At on least the character page. creation yeah. end. Hundred percent. Yeah. And something else that I did, I did find kind of interesting is now we're earlier before we went live, we had talked, we had talked, I had talked with you about um, the particularities of so of some games is. Equip equipment chapter, but mm -hmm. one thing that I noticed with with what you have here that I'm I'm hoping is kept is that is this rule ch is this rule chart for the one handed or two handed version of we of um each weapon, mm -hmm. um daggers notwithstand notwithstanding and bows notwithstanding because who's gonna want who's gonna one hand a full on bow. Unless you're very, 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 yeah. very dexterous, as in can <laughs> fire a bow with your feet, dexterous. Yeah. <laughs> or you're, I don't know, Oliver Qu Oliver Queen or something. A two-handed dagger is a sword. I, I I don't know what to tell you on that front. Yeah. That's a. But but yeah, no, I I, as it's laid out right now, um, the specific some of the parameters here. There's going to be a lot of parameter tuning and balancing with the with the equipment here so for example um let's touch on the spear because the spear is sort of the quintessential weapon of this age mm -hmm. um so as before we mentioned that if you had two fight or two soldiers two warriors fighting on a beach somewhere each of them is a spear and a shield let's say that warrior we were talking about earlier hits the other warrior with his spear what would then happen is the uh, you would essentially take the spear's damage, which is two plus the warrior's might. So if the warrior's might, you'd go to seven, and you would subtract the armor of the other warrior from it. Mm -hmm. um, and that might end up being something along the lines of five damage. And what's also what I've tried to do here that I failed to mention previously is that it's my goal with this system to make the health to make health and the health of uh, enemies and the health of players easily representable with d6s because one of the biggest issues that i run into in the table and like especially some new dms run into is accurately tracking the health of each individual monster especially when there are like 10 to 15 on the table for some mm -hmm. reason right um roll 20 does this really well um because you can literally attach you can you can write in the health on the monster Right. And, and that's good to go. But if you're playing in person, you basically need to like write it down, have a little sheet. So the, the aim with the health in the system is to make the health broadly representable with just putting like six sided dice down or, you know, D10s, what, whatever, basically putting dice down next to the creatures and next to the tokens mm -hmm. to just easily be able to see how much health is left on those. So if the warrior does five damage to the other warrior total, then that warrior's health drops from like drops from eighteen down to like thirteen, mm -hmm. and then you kind of just continue playing, right? Yeah. Now I did see that when it comes to armor, you do have sh you do have the relationship where more armor means let means less movement. But yes. with shield being one being one entry on armor, I'm I w one question I wanted to ask is how you would handle things like shield bashes because that's gonna be that's gonna be something that inevitably is going to get brought up. Yeah, 100%. Um, so for shield bashing specifically, um, and I think you're right, if it does come up enough, it hasn't come up a huge amount under testing, but mm -hmm. whenever it does end up coming up enough, it'll probably be appropriate to add in a little section under the weapons um, to really quantify this. But as of right now, if you were to bash with a shield, um, you know, it would be a regular might roll on your opponent's might. And then if you beat it, you you hit them. Um, it would probably just be flat might damage. So if your might 
score is four, your might score is five. That would be the flat damage on the shield. Mm -hmm. And then in the case of the shield, because it's such a heavy, large weapon, and if you could consider it a weapon, you would essentially have your opponent, you would, you would contest mites with your opponent. Mm -hmm. And if you win that might test, you knock them down. Yeah. Um, and that is actually, we have that in here as, yeah, knock down is one of the sort of actions you can make during your turn in combat and try to knock down the opponent when you can test might with them. Yeah. The main reason I bring that up is it's something that we see we see so often in fiction, but so many designers in when it comes to role-playing games want to ignore it. The, the idea of using mm -hmm. a shield as a weapon instead of it just being more armor. Yeah, or like for example, in some in some games, like lock it behind a specific ability that you have to unlock or spec into. No, I, I feel like there's a there, there there's a healthy amount of um, there's a healthy amount of an encouraged amount of DM sort of interaction in this game. Um, it, it is this is a cooperative storytelling game, um, and if something if some edge case does come up, then then yeah, I mean. Uh, as, as a DM, you can handle that as you wish. But we will have, especially for many of the cases that we uncover during testing, we're going to have rules in there and guidelines and recommendations and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, one, one particular thing that I did find kind of interesting, especially given some of the other stuff I've covered on this channel, is the concept of Brave Hades. Yes. So Brave Hades is awesome. And we <laughs> we um, we actually lost... A, we had a playtesting session last night. And we lost a character to it. Mm -hmm. um, the party was having a final showdown with this Greek mercenary trying to hunt down... As we were... Um, I should have mentioned previously, but it's on the Kickstarter page. One of the... One of the adventures, in fact, the largest adventure that we're releasing alongside of the book is against the sorcerers of Babel, where this cabal of evil sorcerers from Babylon under their king Nabonidus are trying to recapture and sort of recover all of these lost words of power from five centuries past, 20 generations. And the party is playtesting this right now. And the final combat of the session came down to a Greek mercenary leader who had stolen one of these words of power from a tomb and the party is trying to track it down so they can recapture it and stop the Babylonians from getting to it. Mm -hmm. And during this fight, the warrior character in the party, the definitely the most competent in combat, was put to zero health. And he had the option of either falling unconscious or braving Hades to risk a death. He chose to brave Hades. And when you brave Hades, here's, here's the trade-off essentially. Instead of falling unconscious, you rise. You immediately take an action as if it were your turn. And then you are considered to be braving Hades until the end of the encounter. If you take any damage for the rest of the encounter, you die in some epic glorious or tragic way befitting to the source of the damage so if you get killed by someone's club you know your head explodes from the club if you get um thrown down a well you know you can imagine um so you take this massive risk of your character just outright dying for the chance to stay in the fight or accomplish some last deed or some brave goal that kind of thing so our warriors stayed in the fight to try to shut down this mercenary and stop him from getting to the sorcerers that, that were not nearly as adept in combat. Mm -hmm. It's pretty epic. Yeah. Cause, and we've seen, um, I've, I've seen my, I've seen my fair share of this kind of this kind of thing of giving somebody mm -hmm. that last second boost, but your character's not coming back after it. Um, mm -hmm. one of our, one of the favorite examples we've seen here in, the temple it was in the game Heavens and Heresies, which is currently in development, where each each okay. class had an ability called Raising the Death Flag. Okay. If you raise it, um, a lot of your class features get ridiculously overpowered for the duration of that scene. But that character is going to die at the end of the scene, and when you build a new character, you're locked off from that class. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. Interesting. So it has a sort of like meta feel to it. It's like it's a little bit outside in that way. Yeah, okay, it's cool. the it's essentially game essentially a ga a essentially a gamifying the going out and going out in a blaze of glory kind of moment. Yes, and that's 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 sort of gamifying that moment or giving the option. Like for example, um, when there is that epic moment in the game mm -hmm. when things are looking bad and you don't know you're going to come out of this. And then one of the character one of the characters chooses to instead of go down, you know maybe he gets maybe he gets pulled away and saved by a teammate. But this goal is too valuable, and there's this epic dramatic moment when they choose to instead just brave Hades, risk immediate death to get the goal done, and it, it just adds an awesome level to to the game. Mm -hmm. Now the now even. Given the, given the way um, given the way health wor health works and that and that it's pr it's pretty low, is it a, is it a case where um, where somebody some where even even somebody who's in full who's in full armor could go down in a couple of hits? A couple of severe like really bad hits. Like if um, if someone is in like pretty good armor hmm. and they get they get smashed a couple of times by someone with a big two handed mole, then yeah, they're gonna they're gonna go down. Um, I will mention that there are two sort there 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 are two sort of oh like you know main classes as it were in this game. There's the warrior and the sorcerer. Now falling under the warrior, there's a bunch of things. You know any any kind of warrior or soldier you can imagine, you know, archers, um, you know rogues, that whole thing. That all fits underneath the sort of warrior bucket. Um, and those warriors they excel in the domain of combat. And and they can also they can also do well in some other things like like talk and in social situations. But but they're they're sort of they're they're a fish in water when they're in combat. They love combat. They're they're bred. They're made for combat. Um, sorcerers are definitely capable of combat too, especially if they if they deliberately train towards it and want to be good at combat. Sorcerers have you know they have that ability. Mm -hmm. But sorcerers take on. A whole nother role um especially well the three kinds of sorcerer that are present here are the speaker and a speaker is a sorcerer that memorizes and collects words of power mm -hmm. and sort of fundamental truths and that sort of thing and brings change upon the world with their voice in combat they can they could they could do combat like a like a standard sort of fighter if they wish but they have these words of power that they've collected and they can use some of those in combat. Some of the really powerful words of power, um, for example, in the against the sorcerers of Babel campaign, those, those words of power that the, that the sorcerers sent out from Babel are looking for are dangerous to cast and dangerous to memorize and use. And they could bring you real physical harm and detriment, but they're incredibly powerful. Um, the binder, which is another kind of sorcerer, knows the words and symbols used to like bargain with bind dominate various spirits demons and other worldly creatures mm -hmm. um uh, a couple of examples of this that we had through through gameplay um the characters found a demon um and essentially i, I can pull the name but i think it was nim or roost Mm -hmm. um the drown knowledge that was his that was his by name and he was bound in a he was bound in a clay obelisk and the binder approached the obelisk and the binder was the one that interfaced and bound and asked questions of this bound demon to try to find out some vital information um another example of the binder at work is this binder in particular used a large sort of two-handed club in combat and sort of tried to keep his distance, but he had that big source of damage when he, he needed it and to knock people down and knock them away and that kind of thing. They were entering a particularly grueling fight and he needed a way to make himself just better at combat. So he decided to try to entreat. They, they were carrying around this, this large sort of brazier with them in this deep cave so they'd have some source of light and it was this bright burning brazier. So he decided to entreat the spirit of that fire to sort of assist him 
and leap onto his weapon and aid him in combat. He, I called it a medium, I called it a medium spirit check or a medium binding check. He rolled a spirit plus his wisdom as per the binder. He made the roll. And as a consequence, and as we sort of discussed myself, the, the, the GM and this sorcerer, the fire leapt onto his maul. And all of a sudden his maul could, it could deal more damage. It was, it was a flame. Um, some of the enemies were afraid of it because he's, he's, he has this flaming maul, right? So the, the binder has a lot of room for that kind of, that kind of gameplay and shenanigans. Um, the third and definitely the most difficult to sort of design and present in a, in an easy way is the master of symbols. Mm-hmm. Um, on the surface, the master of symbols is the bane of other sorcerers. Um, they sort of see the primordial truths and deep symbolism involved in magic and the world and ritual. The master of symbols will try rituals at the most of the time they will arbitrate with the dungeon or with the dungeon master, with the game master, whatever, essentially. Um, but they will arbitrate some kind of effect they want to have happen. Like if they want to, if they want to perform some kind of ritual to, to their God, to light some weapon of flame or to bring about some sort of end to some creature, if they can like, if they can reasonably put something together that makes symbolic sense, Mm -hmm. then they then roll a timer die and they roll a spirit check. And if they get it in that many turns, so say we roll a D four and we get a two in two turns, that ritual will complete. And if successful, that effect will go off. Um, It's definitely the least polished, but I think that the master of symbols just for what it could potentially do, is the most unique part of the system. And I'm really excited to flesh it out in a way that's like really approachable for, for players. Mm-hmm. Now with that, with that kind of thing and with that kind of thing in mind, given the, given the talent based approach that you're taking with, with the art, with the archetypes is in, is our individual or individual spells or the like, or in this, say, say words of power for the speaker, or or symbols for the, um, well, master master of symbols, would those be treated as individual talents? Hmm. So things like the words, like words of power, for example, those are sort of agnostic. They are they are cast by anyone, any kind of sorcerer. That is absolutely a thing that can be done. Mm-hmm. But for example, the speaker specializes in them. And what the talent trees give you, and, and the talent trees, keep in mind, are are not fully fleshed out yet. We just have the first couple of levels to test around with and get a feel for what we need. Um, it is the least it is the least polished part of the system, and we're currently testing it pretty frequently. Um, but what the talent trees are meant to do is give you bonuses to incentivize exactly the way you want to play. Um, keeping with what I mentioned earlier and kind of one of the taglines for for this book and for this system, we want you to be able to sit down with you know a, a game master and four players, for example, and ideally get you running that game in like half an hour. Like get you good to go, all characters made, all fine. So with the talent trees, especially, um, we want to include some options that are that are you know not too complicated, not active abilities, pretty easy to understand, good to go. But at the same time, for the players who want to really mess around with some strange fringe builds or uh, specializations or that kind of thing and make sort of unique, cool combinations. We also want to include some options in the talent trees that are strange or that are like active abilities or if, if we were talking about it in a, in a video game sense. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I should mention too that as a um, you aren't restricted to one talent tree. When you at first level, dependent on what class you picked, if you clicked, if you uh, picked warrior, uh, binder, speaker or master of symbols, 
your first level goes in that first part of the tree, in that first sort of initial thing, and you get some small bonus. Um, but every time you level up, and core core of the rules, um, you, you can if you want to if you want to do experience points, go for it. If you want to find some some other way to do it, um, go for it. But essentially, the baseline for this game for leveling up is a milestone system. Um, whereas at the end of every you know couple of sessions or a vignette or a sort of mini adventure, as it were, you gain a level. And when you gain that level, you can put it into one of the talent trees and grab an ability of your choosing. And that is that is sort of at the moment, and some of this is up to revision. Um, that is the current sort of main way of progression outside of, you know, learning words of power, acquiring magical items, acquiring, you know, special knowledge, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, connections, you know, uh, experience in the world, as it were. Yeah. Now, given given that, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that um, all that it would take to get to um, have somebody be a gish is just t is just taking one of the. If somebody starts out as warrior, but they want to have a little bit of casting, all they'd have to do is just take the take a talent within um, one of the sorcerer classes. A hundred percent. So if you're a warrior, in the example of if we're thinking about it in like a Actually, yeah, let's 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 do this. So, for example, if you have a Greek warrior and he is particularly fond of telling tales and canting stories and the such. Um, he could if when he levels up, he can take a level in speaker, for example. And with that, he gets you know, he can, he could, he's a little better with words. Um, he can sort of use some of these words of power if they're found uh, in the game. Uh, he gets one, one baseline word of power to start off, but essentially the, the Greek warrior who wants to gain some of this power of the speaker, some of this sort of bard like power. Um, and I, and I, a bard is actually an accurate statement because, well, bards have been around literally forever. Um, there's a there's an awesome image. I, I don't know if it's I don't think it's 3100 BC, but it might be like 1400 BC. I'll, I'll pull it up. But there's this awesome um, carving of a Hittite bard with a guitar, mm -hmm. like a very proto guitar. But it's it's like a 2300 year old carving or no 3300 year old carving. Um, so bards have been around at this time. They're not what you would what you would expect from like a modern sort of D&D &D bard. But they're they're great with words. Um, they know how to use some of these words of power. They know the dangers of them, that kind of thing. So yeah, that that Greek warrior could become an epic teller of tales, and a sort of entrance you with his words and such. Yeah, and with that, you've pro now this is something you've probably gotten asked about. But how would you handle um, dual wielding? Yeah, hundred percent. So, as for dual wielding, um, it's it's one of those things that has. It's one of those things that has kind of come up in the playtesting sessions, but hasn't made its way into the formal document. But essentially, with dual wielding, you would gain an additional uh, quick action um, in combat. And actually, we, we kind of skipped over this, but I'll, I'll go into combat briefly. In order to actually, yeah, in order to explain this, I'm going to need to go into combat. Um, as a as a character in combat, on your turn, you get your action and your move action. All of the sort of baseline actions and move actions, and there aren't there aren't many move actions. There's like two. It's it's move and get up. And as for the actions, it's a couple of things like attack, knock down, grapple, and help. Mm -hmm. These are all going to be on a sort of cheat sheet. In the book as well so for especially for new players they can just look at this this like decent sized cheat sheet and be like okay this these are the things that i can do this turn but where combat sort of enters a chaotic phase and this is this has been difficult to design because you do need to sort of master the chaos a little bit but you want it to be you want it to still have that chaotic feel every character gets Every character gets a couple of what are known as quick actions. Mm -hmm. um, 
you can use these quick actions on another creature's turn. Uh, you get you get to use one per turn, and you can you you can't use the same one more than once per round. So one of the quick actions, for example, is move half your speed. You can use that once per round, but on any other player's turn. So like if you're a, if you're a sorcerer, mm -hmm. and you're trying to you're trying to stay away or complete some task or do some spell or ritual, and this you know this uh, this big Hittite warrior leaps over the wall and rushes at you with the sword you can use your quick action to move half your move away and try to like get away from him basically um so if you were a dual wielder you would gain an additional quick action attack and you could basically make that attack with your offhand and a quick action attack is a regular attack but it it's hard it it's less likely to hit and it does a little less damage mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've I've messed around with um, with dual wielding since a lot since a lot of games that utilize it um, ends up end up going into one of two ways. Either a the rules for dual wielding are to, don't have enough of an impact, or b uh, you can have them have an impact, but in order to do that, you've got to go through all these damn steps. To the point, to the point where advancement feels like false choice, and I'm looking straight at you, third third edition and Pathfinder. You know what you did, and your name. How about is I? How about I just? Rudges. How about I just do a? Um, you can you can do a wield in five e. You just need three feats for it. Right? That's a... No. <laughs> like no. Do I? We don't the... need per se, but like in order to like quote unquote be an awesome dual wielder, like you kind of need like like two three feats for it. But yeah, that's still that's still too many. Yeah, oh no, it's absolutely too many. Um, and that's why, like in this in this, for example, like if you have that offhand weapon, you gain an additional quick action you could do once per round, and it is an attack with that weapon. Uh, Full stop. The the thing I always use as my as my whipping boy when it com when it comes to this sort of thing mm -hmm. is whirlwind attack in Pathfinder, and all the stuff mm. that you need. The idea of whirlwind attack is is akin to the full charge full charge attack you see in ev you've seen in every Zelda game since um, a link yes. to the past. Mm -hmm. But in order in order to get it in Pathfinder, you need to have a dexterity and intelligence of thirteen. Oh no! You need a base attack. <laughs> yes, it gets Why? worse. You need a base attack bonus of at least four. And you need the following either feats or features. Combat expertise, dodge, mobility, and spring attack. Oh, man. Like, Yeah, th there's a lot that I love about 3.5 and Pathfinder. And I, I will mention that like, I, am a, I absolutely adore a lot of the 3.5 books, especially the lore books. I have the Draconomicon on my desk down there. It's mm -hmm. just, it's phenomenal. And it has all sorts of cool tables and rules and all the such and i love using those books for like preparing a session for D D or other games um and for just getting inspiration and ideas but i look at the stat blocks of the monsters and there's just like 30 keywords and i'm, I'm looking at that and i'm like no i do not want to do this and right. don't even get me started on how useless challenge rating is for setting up encounters Oh, because man. it is useless. I know some people will swear by it, but it but anything that relies on a certain on too many assumptions is not worth keeping. And that, yeah. And of of course, and of course the other the other thing that has, that I see as not worth keeping that people insist on mm -hmm. is the Vancian model when it comes to magic. I hated yeah, it yeah. when I started with the black box era not the black box, the black book era of AD and D in the nineties. Mm -hmm. And I still hate it. <laughs> so I am a I'm a huge and I, I say I say what I'm about to say as a massive fan of Jack Vance. Um I oh man, I, I love I love Jack Vance. I like I love I love Jack Vance's stuff. As far as far as his books, but that but that whole spells per day, and you've got to and you've got to prepare them every, every day, and after you cast a spell, you forget them and don't let no. 
Yeah, and like especially like yeah, I'm I'm just I'm and I'm gonna say this is a massive fan of Jack Vance and Dying Earth. I've I've read Dying Earth like five, six times. Um and but at the same time, at least uh, especially in the way that, that the magic system is kind of portrayed nowadays, it's just there's a lot of just a lot of just weirdness and like these like preset precharged spells. Bronze Age Collapse at a role playing game at, at least conceptually and especially this game is supposed to be a, a collaborative storytelling experience, right? Mm-hmm. Um in my eyes. And the magic in this game, like th- there is no firebolt in Bronze Age Collapse, right? And and firebolt has its place in different settings, 100%, 100%, it does. But in the in the system that this is, magic is more about sort of ritual. Magic is more about sort of ritual and words of power which are, are they're kind of like spells in a way, but there, there's a different like symbolic meaning and they're used in a couple of different ways. And they're also a lot more like a lot more like loot in a couple of ways. Right? Regardless, um, Bronze Age Collapse focuses much more on how spells can help build the story and, and how they can be dramatic in combat in a tense situation and less on the sort of systematized version of that. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely. Yeah, because for me, and I'm not I'm not sure if you've had the same experience, but for me that whole what's funny about the Dying Earth books is that they lean far they lean far into the sword and sorcery thing, and in that that particular style, I'm perf- of magic as a as a highly advanced form of math. I'm mm-hmm. fine with to I'm fine within that universe. You put that in say, in say the most litigious role playing game. And that's that is clearly going for a a more a more higher a more higher magic kind of fantasy where magic is some is something that everybody knows about on some level. Magic is a science in those worlds. More, right. le- it's it, it it is one, even though a lot of people cl- um try to try to claim it isn't. <laughs> oh, well, whereas sort of the goal I'm going for here is that like. Everyone has their tales yeah. of the gods and heroes and the such, and of strange sorcerer kings in the east, and that kind of thing. But magic is nowhere near a common thing. There are a couple of wise men and sorcerers that have mastery over it, but a lot of the fighting and boots on the ground and work in that regard and adventuring is done by sort of swashbuckling guys and spears and sandals, right? Mm-hmm. And the 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 problem that I've always had with with that with that setup is it is it being an artifact of what came before, um, because in chainmail mages were artillery. Because mm-hmm. let's not let's yes. not forget a lot of a lot of the early traditions were born out of the war gaming scene in the seventies. And I, I am a huge fan of of war games in general, um, mainly uh, mainly Warhammer. To be honest, uh, but I've also delved into War Machine and a couple others. Yeah, um, I actually I recently picked up. Um, well, I say recently picked up because it, it finally arrived. But <laughs> um, Kingdoms and Warfare mm-hmm. from uh, Matt Colville, which I'm I'm actually I'm I'm midway through reading right now and trying to sort of absorb. It's it's a very dense book. Um, but yeah, and but the the thing is, it's a case of you can't have it both ways. You can't have yes. a you can't have a, a magic system designed for low magic and then try and transplant it into a into um high or even epic fantasy. Um, it's certainly difficult. Yeah. Plus plus in do, in doing so you have to go out of your way to try and justify why mages have to be these ridicu- these ridiculously OP OP affairs um mm-hmm. to the point where to the point where Godzilla is a thing. What's Godzilla? Um, the cod in it is short for cleric or druid, because oh yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, in yeah. in five in five v we re- we um reformat it to be cowzilla cleric or warlock, because mm-hmm. somebody who knows what they're doing with e- with either or even both of those classes 
is playing the game on easy mode. Yeah, there's a um, so I, and again, I, I think you mentioned earlier that you were you were familiar a little bit with the Black Company, mm -hmm. but there's a um, it, it's pretty influential to a lot of how I think about fantasy and world building and that kind of thing. Um, there's a and I won't go into spoilers really, but there is a point in the second book where the uh, couple of members of the Black Company and a couple of local guys need to take down one of these big time wizards, one of these 10 who were taken essentially um, powerful liches uh, capable of devastating magic and that kind of thing. And in that world, mages for the most part are all about trickery and deception and illusions and that kind of thing. But there are a couple of really powerful ones that can like throw fireballs and that kind of thing. Um, and what they do to take him out is they, you know, they trick him, they get the jump on him. Right. He rolls up and because they know he is this powerful mage and they're like, OK, well, if we, if we let him cast his magic and do what he needs to do, he's going to kill all of us. So they they jump him. You know, they they hit him with a trap. They they leap onto him with like like five, six people. They just overwhelm him. Um, I'm a big fan of of that kind of strategy when it comes to high level casters interacting with with uh quote like regular adventurers quote unquote so for example um if you're playing a sorcerer in the system and like you find yourself on the wrong side of combat and there is a and there's a big dude there's there's you know there's there's, there's a big dude with uh with a maul or like a two-handed axe or something bearing down on you you are in trouble um but if if the warriors can kind of keep people away if you can keep your distance or you can get the jump on anyone then as a mage you're in a phenomenal position you're, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a great time All right mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind you also have three um three modules that you, that are going to be attached in this in this project that i th that I think you made clear or meant that all three of them can be can be starting modules. It's just the circumstance that you're starting with. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the elevator pitch for all for all three of them in terms of the tone of those adventures, starting 100%. with the Rage of Achilles? So the Rage of Achilles, it's it's short. Um, you could if you really cut it down, you could probably make it one session, but realistically, it's going to be around three sessions. Mm -hmm. um, the the elevator pitch for it is Troy is being sieged. This is during the siege of Troy. This is during the period of the Iliad. Um, you you get to fight alongside and interact with and, and join heroes like Achilles. And, you know, I mean, obviously Hector's on the other side, but but Hector and, and the whole sort of crowd, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, in the adventure, a glaring weakness in Troy's defenses is revealed by the god Apollo. And you and the Greeks find a way to maybe end the siege in one fell swoop. And the adventure is you trying to go and delve in and exploit that weakness and break the whole thing open. Um, while at the same time contending with uh, various heroes, warriors, um, Greek gods, because they're on either side at this point in the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is that adventure. That is the Rage of Achilles. And of course, Zeus is on whichever side has prettier women because it's Zeus. <laughs> yes, Zeus is, uh, and as you could probably tell from that statement, Zeus is neutral. <laughs> he doesn't want anyone involved. He's like, there are pretty women on both sides. You know, well, so. that, well, that, and he, that, and he's made th that, and um, he's our, every time Zeus get, gets involved, he ends up making everything worse. Exactly. Oh, uh, and actually, that's one of the that's one of the things in the Iliad. It's like. Zeus is kind of Zeus or, you know, Jupiter, whatever version you're reading. Um, he's like, he's like, no, you, you all need to not get involved. And I think he, 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 he sort of, he spurns Hera at some point. He, I'm pretty sure he beats the crap out of Ares. Um, but he just, he doesn't want anyone involved, right? Cause he, it's like, if you get involved, you're going to be punished, but the yeah. gods keep finding their ways to go down there and get involved in the siege. Right? Yeah. Um, so the the second one would be against the sorcerers of Babylon, which is a very Indeed. old school title. Absolutely. Um, 
against the sorcerers of babylon is the longest campaign here i, I say campaign uh the longest adventure per se you could probably link some of these adventures um mm -hmm. with some with some decent writing and in the book we'll probably put in some ways that you could potentially like if you run the rage of achilles maybe you can lead that into something else uh pretty easily but against the sorcerers of babylon what is known as the cult of babel under the sorcerer king of babylon nabonidus have begun to recover the words of power that were scattered when their infamous tower was destroyed they search all over the mediterranean and mesopotamia and egypt and all the such to basically recover these words and at the time the the tower was destroyed some 20 generations ago so the, he sends these sorcerers out now the issue with these sorcerers is all of them are out for themselves and they're not really on an allied front and they're more than willing to attack and disrupt each other to get their hands on these words um regardless if if these if these words of power get back to the tower and the adventure starts with a deep sort of vision of the end of the world as the tower pierces the heavens and slays the gods as babylon sort of rises up to dominate the world um that is that those are the stakes hmm. so as you know as a party you're trying to find these words of power before the sorcerers do and contend with the sor with the sorcerers when you run into them maybe pit them against each other mm -hmm. um it's going to be at least at least 10 sessions 16 to 20 is probably a better estimate on this adventure yeah and the last of the three is the plight of ugarit indeed so ugarit is a Ugarit is actually, in, in real world terms, a pretty pretty famous city in regards to the collapse of the Bronze Age. Um, if I have the story right, there was a tablet found in the buried city of Ugarit that is essentially a call for help from the final king of Ugarit as he has sent his ships away to foreign lands to fight wars there. He sent his troops to the land of the Hittites. And his country is essentially abandoned and defenseless against what are the sea peoples. Um, the adventure takes place over around six sessions as one of the largest cities in the, especially in this side of the Mediterranean, begins to just societally collapse as these raiders and sea peoples and other things raid the city and pe uh, the people of the city turn against each other the few soldiers left exploit this fact um, it's this sort of just collapse of a society and at the same time as the sea people and the raiders and the such are making the most of the chaos and are destroying temples uh, taking artifacts in some cases unearthing the idols of the gods from these places and breaking the seals beneath these ancient temples. Strange sort of long buried secrets from a time before the flood begin to surface. A sort of Lovecraftian um, cosmic sort of horror feel as these things that were sealed beneath Ugarit and beneath some of these temples begin to sort of rise and make their presences known. Um, six to 10 sessions for this adventure. Um, and definitely one of one of the ones I'm the most excited about. And with all that with all that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a um, total page count with all this? Yeah, um, if it is possible, and I'm not sure if it is. I, I laying it out, it looks like it's it's going to become less and less likely to be possible. We would like it to be very close to. We would like it to be very close to between ninety and hundred pages. That is the sort of count. It's starting to look likely it might go a little over that, or over that in general, um, as we're putting this together. But yeah, uh, the rough page count that we're initially shooting for is between ninety and hundred on this. All right, and what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Yeah, so let me pull this up here. Uh, the release window that we're shooting for right now for the actual PDF, um, it does say February on the Kickstarter. 
the PDF itself in its like full sort of form, um, maybe a couple of erratas here and there is looking like it's more likely to be March. Um, and after we get the PDF done, that's when the printing will start for those physical copies. And likely those will aiming, aiming for April, May, but probably good to allow some time for, you know, issues with the printers and that kind of thing. So yeah, I'd say somewhere around May, hopefully for the physical books. Mm -hmm. And I, I will be looking forward to seeing that. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones. <laughs> we are the only 30 minute time zone in uh, <laughs> North America. That's that's all good. It's bad. It's bad enough that whenever I get somebody from Michigan, I have to ask, OK, OK, um, upper or lower peninsula, because depending on what you say, I may have to. adjust. Uh, that's hilarious, actually. Yeah. Uh, I have the same. And of course, um, Australia's time zones are even worse. <laughs> are they? What are Australian time zones like? Uh, you've got you've. I think somebody had sh somebody had shown uh, one, one, but you have you have some time zones that are that that have a that that not only have a half hour have a half and a half. Um, what? Australian. <laughs> here's here's the names of them. Australian yeah, Western good. Standard, Australian Central okay. Western, Australian Central, Australian Eastern, Australian Central Daylight, Australian Eastern Daylight, and Lord Got Howe it. Daylight, just to cover Lord Howe Island. Uh, great, great. One of the one of them, um, Central Western is is um has ut is a is eight eight hours and forty five minutes off of UTC. So scheduling for that must be an absolute nightmare. Um, <laughs> uh, but oh, man, but that's the thing with Australia too. Like if you're trying to sync up, like it either has to be early in the day for us or, you know, this is the reason the why I ask people how late is late. Cause everybody says, Oh, I, oh, I, I can mm -hmm. be up late. I'm like, are we talking, are we talking, or are we talking late in the evening or are we talking ass end of the morning? Yes. Are we talking four o'clock in the morning for time zone accounting? Mm -hmm. Is that, <laughs> Because <laughs> I can I can yeah. do any, I can do any of that because because I'm always on standby, but not everybody has my constitution. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> but anytime you <laughs> see fit to return, whether it's to com further complain about time zones or to or to la or to laugh at pe laugh at people who keep saying that th that this is going to be the year of the Leafs, uh, oh, the goodness. door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Beautiful. Oh. Thank you so much, Mildred. Yeah, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mildred.